Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language. This week, I have an extra special multiple interview episode for you about the classic children's cartoon, Schoolhouse Rock. I actually made this five years ago with Holly Hutchings, who's our digital operations specialist at Quick and Dirty Tips now. But then we never released it on the feed because of concerns about the music being copyrighted. But when I heard last week it was the 50th anniversary of the show, I really wanted to release this episode, so we decided to strip out the music to solve the problem. So if any of the transitions sound a tiny bit off to you, that's why. But I really wanted you to hear it, especially since we have an interview with one of the creators, George Newell, who died back in October. I'm here today with Holly Hutchings, one of my former students who now works in radio, and she is helping me put together this episode on Schoolhouse Rock. Actually, she did most of the work. <laughs> <laughs> so when I approached Holly about this episode, she didn't know what Schoolhouse Rock was, which made me want to do it even more. <laughs> do, you, do you love it now, Holly? I kind of do love it, yes. <laughs> I feel like I missed out on something really important and awesome, but I get it now in my 30s, so that's Yay. cool. Yeah, you're just a, a slightly too young to have had it growing up, I think. Yeah, they said it ran through the early 80s, and I was watching way too much TV in the early 80s, but maybe just not this for some reason. Maybe not those Saturday morning cartoons. Yeah. Well, we have an excellent show for you about the history of Schoolhouse Rock and the people behind it, so let's get started. I remember people talking about them. I remember people singing the songs. I remember, like, even educators using them. But I don't I don't have a specific memory of me, like, watching I'm a Bill. Now, my son is 10, and we've gone through our multiplication facts, and we've gone through civics, and I get, grammar is another one. <laughs> we've gone through all those things. It's afforded us that opportunity to learn in a different way. I never watched Schoolhouse Rock growing up. The only thing I'm familiar with from the show is the I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill. I think I just saw that over the years after the fact. You know, the preamble when they had a note for fifth grade, that was the first thing I went to was the preamble, Schoolhouse Rock. Schoolhouse Rock was a short animated program that taught concepts like math, civics, and of course, grammar. It ran on ABC Saturday mornings during cartoons from 1972 until the early 80s. Schoolhouse Rock began when David McCall of the advertising agency McCaffrey and McCall in New York realized that his child could sing all the rock songs of the day, but was struggling to remember the multiplication tables they were learning in school. McCall tasked fellow ad man George Newell with the job of finding someone who could put math to music and not be boring about it. Here's George. And I did know uh, a fellow named Bob Duro. And Bob came up... Uh, to our agency, we had a meeting, and uh, David said, told him what he wanted to do, and Bob said, okay, I'll be back in three weeks, and in three weeks, she came back uh, with the song, Three is a Magic Number, and the genius of the song is that instead of just, there used to be, when I was a kid, a, a thing on the radio called The Singing Lady, and she just sang these things, but Bob put them in a context, and, you know, it takes three legs to make a... a <clears throat> a stool, it takes three of this, three of that. Last line of, of, before he got into the counting was, a man and a woman had a little baby. There were three in the family. Three is a magic number. And it's just, you know, we just looked at one another and were astonished. Newell went right to the art department and found his partner, Tom Yoey, who ran the department at the agency. He asked Yoey to create sketches to match the lyrics of their new tune. The ad agency had the ABC account, Actually, their biggest account. They knew ABC was looking for some educational programming, so they created a storyboard of what the song could look like as a cartoon. ABC loved the idea and the drawings. They signed on to run the shorts under one condition. Yoey had to illustrate them. So you said you guys looked at each other after you heard three is a magic number, and I imagined magic happening, like... <gasps> This could be was. A thing. It was. Everybody, you know, I, 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 I thought they had tears in my eyes. I mean, you, you got to think that, you know, this, this guy is, uh, Bob was from Arkansas and he, you know, had this incredible Southern drawl, drawl, and he, uh, 
he had a nice, really nice soft voice, and uh, it was it was it was a moment it, that struck us all, and uh, and it would you know, the rest was history. The show just saw its forty fifth anniversary and is known all over, even being referenced by President Obama when asked in an interview how government could work better. When they get back in session, yeah. do you believe? You know the way to get things done for the American people so that we don't have another shutdown of the government, which effectively punishes everybody else except the lawmakers. There is a very simple way to do this, which is, you know, uh, maybe you're not old enough to remember Schoolhouse Rock, but... No, I remember it. Remember how the bill gets passed? The songs are all different. Some of them, the music carries them. And on others, it's it's the art. It's Tom's cartooning that carries them. And a good example of that is I'm Just a Bill, and that was written by Dave Frischberg. But it's a very straightforward song. There are, no, there are no gimmicks to it. It just takes you to the process. But the character that Tom designed was just so memorable that it's, it's used constantly. Newell says they weren't aware at the time of making the show that they were creating something that would become so fundamental to so many people. They were just having a good time. Many people contributed to making Schoolhouse Rock the success it is. Jazz legends like Lynn Ahrens, Blossom Deary, and Jack Sheldon, and others voiced the lyrics, and gifted writers like Dave Frischberg, George Newell, and Bob Durow developed the memorable lyrics. It was a collaborative environment, though, and each person dabbled in different roles. If an animator had an idea, they'd do it. If the singers had a better lyric, it would get changed. Vocalist for the first song and many more, Bob Durow, passed away in April of 2018. His daughter, Ara Lee DeRoe, remembers Schoolhouse Rock from the beginning. So I'm a musician myself and one of the first Schoolhouse Rock fans. She was in grade school when her dad wrote Three is a Magic Number. Oh, I remember it because I was in the perfect um, age range for multiplication rock, which was the beginning of it all. I was learning to multiply in third and fourth grade. So did your dad try out the songs on you, or? Oh, yeah. I mean, he definitely tried them out on me. And, and we, you know, we always talked about math. I mean, it was just the perfect time to be <laughs> writing songs about math with a, a daughter of the age that I was. Sometimes he not only bounced ideas around at home to try on for size, he also included his family in the music itself. And then I do remember, now I think it was third grade, but getting out of school early and we went to New York City to a recording studio. And I bet George was there in the recording booth with my dad and they had Zero recorded. And I added the voice of the girl. Zero? How can Zero be a hero? How can Zero be a hero? Years later, her dad worked on his other music at jazz clubs and would often have college-aged waiters and waitresses recognize him purely by his undeniable voice. They'd hear him sing, and they'd say, wait a minute, you're that guy. That's you, and three is a magic number. And Conjunction Junction is a great audience participation song because it even has three-part harmony, (laughs) which uh, Daddy would teach the audience to sing all the parts. Darrell added Schoolhouse Rock to his repertoire and then would make the audience join in. Schoolhouse Rock extends beyond the hearts and memories of those who grew up loving it. There is a live show that licenses between 300 and 500 performances every year, for example. However, one of the most enduring ways it continues is through the throngs of teachers who still use the songs in the classroom. I'm Alicia Takaoka. I am an instructor at a university in Hawaii. When I teach writing, uh, we talk about fanboys and uh, conjunction for conjunction. So I sing a little bit of conjunction junction. And then we talk about I'm just a bill when uh, we talk about the process of how bills become laws when we talk about science policy. Alicia says only a couple students a year now know her source material. But before long, all the students start singing along and retaining the concepts taught. George Newell and Bob Duro performed a concert at the Kennedy Center's Millennium Stage in 2013. It's said to be the largest audience the venue hosted to date, with over 2,000 attendees, according to Newell. Dustin Renwick, freelance journalist in D.C., was one of the fans there. 
He, like me, had missed the Schoolhouse Rock train as a kid, but the show took on a special meaning when he hit grad school. Um, and that's kind of the reason I went to this show, um, was because of a grad school professor. And yeah, in class, she used Schoolhouse Rock. I mean, that was, you were going through the basic parts of speech, and it was this really catchy way to not only remember them, but learn them. Dustin wanted to give his professor a piece of the show. After the concert, he jumped in line to get his program signed by Bob DeRoe to later give her as a gift. I think you could tell that he recognized that this was not just something for kids. You know, it wasn't it wasn't a weird thing that there was someone there who was, you know, in his mid to late 20s asking for an autograph, um, just in the same way that it wasn't weird that he was going to sign stuff for the five-year-old behind me or, you know, the, the, the person who was 10 years my senior in the back of the line there was no, there was no sense that this was um, time bound, right? Um, that anybody should and could be able to appreciate this, this whether it was for the music or for the tune or for the the learning lesson. Um, that it was something that was accessible and available for all ages. And time will tell if the show continues on another forty years. But ready or not, the effects of the show keep coming. I'm so pleased we were able to get so many people to talk to us about their experiences with Schoolhouse Rock and that there are at least some people out there who love it as much as I did. (laughs) Thanks, Holly Hutchings, for putting this show together. Lolly, 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 get your adverbs here. Quickly, 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 get your adverbs here. Indubitably. I hope you enjoyed that. And finally today, I have a family story and a recommendation. Hi, Grammar Girl. This is Froggy Van Riper calling from St. Louis with a family for you. Uh, my partner and I have three elderly animals, uh, all of whom uh, require medication in the morning and the evening, along with their breakfast and dinner. And it got quite cumbersome to ask each other uh, with our, our varying schedules each day, have the animals been fed, have the animals been medicated? And so we've combined it into, have you fedicated everybody? And so fedicated is now our, our family left, and it, it caught on right away. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Thanks so much for your podcast and for your website, which I have been following since the aughts, uh, as I am a teacher, and I absolutely love your grammar advice. Anyway, take care. Thank you. Thank you. I love that. And I'm sure a lot of animal lovers will find it useful, too. Next, Lisa called in a while ago with this neat app recommendation when we were looking for my dad's favorite science fiction book from his childhood. Hi, my name is Lisa Rubio. Are you familiar with the website called LibriVox? L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X. It's called An Acoustical Liberation of Books in the Public Domain. It's wonderful. It's where uh, amateur uh, narrators read books that are in the public domain, and it's completely free. And you actually can become a reader. I actually have a few sections in here where I read. But also in the LibriVox, there's a section. It's called the Short Science Fiction Collections. There's probably, I'm going to say, 1,500 stories. Not every single one is spoken well. Okay, but from that, your dad would probably start that and he will die. He will weep with joy if he doesn't know about this. And then he'll probably find others that he'll love. And oh my God, it's just a treasure trove. Love your stuff. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for passing that along, Lisa. I downloaded the app and my dad loves audiobooks too. So I'm going to tell him about it just as soon as I finish recording the show tonight. Nobody tell him I've been sitting on this for a month. If you want to share the story of your familect, a family dialect, or word your family and only your family uses, call the voicemail line at 83-321-4GIRL, and I might play it on the show. Be sure to tell me the story behind your word or phrase, and call from a quiet place. Grammar Girl is a Quick and Dirty Tips podcast. Thanks to my audio engineer, Nathan Sims, and my editor, Adam Cecil. Our ad operations specialist is Morgan Christensen. Our marketing and publicity assistant is Davina Tomlin. Our digital operations specialist is Holly Hutchings, and our intern is Cameron Lacey. And I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. That's all. Thanks for listening.